Hey, Dustin Vanoy here. I had a nice uh, holiday break. I uh, got to visit Spain, a beautiful country, after conference season ended. So now I'm trying to catch up on the, the remaining questions I couldn't get around to on YouTube. I couldn't answer with a simple comment. So this video is to cover several questions that I got on PySpark concurrency. So check out the description or check out the different um, scenes in this YouTube video to see what questions I'm going to answer. Let's get right into it. I'm going to do short demos, short descriptions of how you would do these things that uh, people were asking about after I released my video about how you do PySpark concurrency from Databricks notebooks or from Azure Synapse notebooks. Here we go. Okay, so the first question I had was about how do we pass multiple parameters into the function we're going to call? So in my previous video, I had a function called load table, and that's what did most of the work. That's what we want to run uh, concurrently. We want to run multiple instances of that function with different values in order to, um, in, in a normal scenario when I'm working on Spark, kick off multiple Spark workloads basically that are going to uh, send commands to the executors and get the work done on the cluster spread out across multiple workers. Okay, so in this case, I'm doing a super simple thing that does not involve Spark at all and just printing. So I can demonstrate how you do this with Python concurrency, which is really the key to the question. So I have a function, instead of just taking one uh, parameter in, it's going to accept three, okay? A, B, and C. And then I'm gonna build up my list of tuples. So I had a little bit slightly fancy way of building up my table list before. In this example, we're just hard coding the thing. Each item in this Python list is a tuple. The tuple has three elements to correspond to the three arguments that are expected when I call test. So A1, B1, C1 will be my first instance, and then the twos, and then the threes. Each of those was different, and that's I wanted to show that the values will be different. Uh, if the value is the same for every one, uh, it's actually fairly straightforward. We can add that right after this. So I've loaded up these table lists, and then the main thing I've changed here from previous videos about threading and using queues in Python is um, when we call this really core piece of run task, I still pass in a function name, so I've changed that to be the name test, so it reads that function that I set up earlier. And then when I pass in my queue to get the next item from the queue, um, it looks exactly the same as it, as it does if I have one element. I'm going to get that element and call it value. You could give us a better name, but I'm just gonna call it value. But that's not a single element, it's actually a tuple. It's actually, for the first time I, I kick this off, it's going to be that. That's my value. So when I call function right here, I need to do asterisk value, which is using the args uh, capability within, uh, within Python to unpack that into three different items. If I put four things in that tuple, it's going to unpack four things and try to pass those. And I, I expect I'll get an error there if I recall correctly. Um, but I have three, three items in my value, three things to pass in. This star will unpack it. And when I run this thing, we should see that it will print out exactly what I uh, am anticipating. It runs three different times. It actually ran concurrently and it will um, print different things for each run. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, thing I mentioned of what if I've got, what if I've got a static element, how would I handle that? And I think I can just do this to get that back, okay. Uh, so now I've changed my function to accept this job name as the first thing, okay? So in my table list, what I really need to do is not change a thing because job is always the same. I want to use the same job name in this case. That's really what I'm trying to demonstrate. When I come down to call my function in run task, I can, I can modify run task to say um, use the uh, job name hard-coded to, uh, what are we doing here? Let's say concurrency, right? Something like that. Uh, and then do the unpacking after that. So I'm gonna pass in four values, the three that get unpacked from the tuple and one hard-coded value that's gonna be the same for every time I, I, I call an item from the queue and, and process a table and, and is typically the case. I think I got everything checked there. Let's uh, run this guy, see what happens. There we go. So now job is consistent. It doesn't really need to change, so I don't need to add it to the queue each time uh, and, and everything runs and works the way I expect. Okay, one more, one more bonus item here. Uh, we can leave job. I think that'll be just fine. Let's do. Uh, but what I need to do is add in. I think I've got it saved. Yes, I'm going to use a dictionary instead of the tuples. And this is really if you've got uh, a lot of things that are different each time, you can basically build up your dictionary with each item, have it named. So the idea is instead of having having to know that 
uh, A1 is, is my item for A, B1 is my item for B. I could switch up the order as long as I have them named with A, B, and C. And of course, if I wanted to pass in job, I would have something called job and I'd put that in this. this. And so really the, uh, the curly braces here is what dictates that this is a, a list of dictionaries instead of a list of tuples. So here's what really happens then. So let's, let's make sure I run that. I'm not sure if I have yet. I come down and I'm going to uh, change right here where I was doing a star value to take advantage of args is I can do this keyword args thing in Python by doing star star. What it's going to do is it's basically going to treat these as named parameter, named parameters, and it's going to say for each item in my dictionary, um, basically translate uh, a colon a4 to a equals a4. And so it's the equivalent equivalent of if I had a equals a4 in the function call, b equals b4, et cetera. But that's not what I want. What I really want is star star uh, value. And so let's go ahead and try it that way and see what we get. Kicking it off, let's scroll to the bottom here. I must have missed something. Let's check this error message real quick and I'll explain what I did wrong. Okay, so <laughs> you can't do that with a list of tuples. If you're going to do star star, you need to actually change the list that you're looping through to be one that has dictionaries, right? So table list two is what I called it. Now I've got it mapped correctly. Silly mistake that always happens once I hit record. So we're just gonna roll with it today. Beautiful. So I've got um, these named value pairs have been unpacked and used uh, correctly. Uh, and that's basically how we would use multiple arguments, two different options, either using tuples or dictionaries. Um, probably some other ways to do it. Certainly other ways to use tuples. I could have my, my function expect a tuple or expect a dictionary and then just deal with it that way. Um, quite, a, quite a few options you could work with here. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and jump to the next question. Okay, so another question I received was, can we run this via a notebook? And maybe it was more of a suggestion of other ways people have done it. Uh, can I just kick off another notebook instead of having a load table function that that runs this stuff in parallel? And so let me show you uh, what that looks like. Um, I guess my first, my, my response to that is, well, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's really a matter of preference, I think. I'd say the more complex the, the logic is, the more likely I am to separate it in its own notebook. Or, or of course, if I need to reuse that logic across multiple places, having it in its own notebook is a pretty easy way to call it. Uh, from a variety of kind of wrapper jobs like like what we'll be doing here. So to start with on the Databricks side, let's go to um, kind of the key piece of this that changes, which really isn't that complicated. So I've got this uh, this more uh, more complete advanced uh, solution that I, that I've done, even though it's probably probably still needs some tweaking to cover everything for Stack Overflow data. Uh, and I did a very similar video, um, the last video I posted uh, late 2022 was covering an example I've been doing in some of my conference presentations that, that covers this. And so I won't go through like everything going on here. I won't really get into the change data feed stuff that I'm starting to use more and more with this type of load, but let's focus on our load table command. And so I've got load table taking in multiple arguments. In this case, it actually is like a dictionary of arguments, but I'm not going to do anything with it here. I'm going to pass it along to a notebook that's ready to work with it. So the way we call a notebook within Databricks uh, if we want to um, be able to wrap it with this concurrency capability, if we want to get a response back and check it for whether or not it succeeded or something else happened, uh, is we use dbutils notebook.run, okay? And then we'll give it the notebook name. You can play around, if it's not in the same directory, play around with um, how you would reference things in a different directory. Uh, but the, typically I try to keep the notebook I'm running and the wrapper job in the same uh, folder if I can. You give it some sort of timeout, I've made mine super long, and then you can uh, pass along arguments that will be, be sent to that notebook. Uh, maybe I'll show you real quick what that looks like in case uh, that's something new to you. Uh, and so when we do this, uh, basically what I do is I get the status back, I'm expecting it to get a string back, I'll check that and raise my own error message if it doesn't work. That does get us into what happens if we're running this and some of them work but others don't, how do we do error handling? We're about to get to there because that's a separate question I wanna address. Um, so as we're going, just a quick glimpse that our run task function is pretty much how I, I typically do it with a little bit of error handling things added that I'll talk about. Uh, I went ahead and built up my table list a little bit more explicitly in this example because I wanted to actually 
change column names, pick which columns I use. I don't want a full copy of the table as a, in a simple way like I have in the past. And then um, the rest of this is pretty much the same with the error handling baked in. Uh, so that's, uh, that's from my previous run. I'll go ahead and kick it off even though it's uh, not super important whether or not this particular instance completes because we've highlighted the important piece here. We'll go ahead and run that just in case it's helpful in a moment. Now, uh, let me show you how we accept those parameters in Databricks first, and then I'll show you uh, the same thing in Azure Synapse Notebooks because it's similar but slightly different logic. Might as well just cover that too. So here I have the, the notebook I was calling. If you, if you remember, it was called Stack Overflow Refine Table Load. And so as I'm going, I can actually set up parameters in the notebook by using this dbutils widget uh, syntax. And so you can actually see the widgets that I've set up are here, and I can populate those by typing text in. And I've got default values as well that actually don't make any sense with Stack Overflow data. They're just left over from another project I did. Uh, and then as I go down, um, those widgets do get used at some point. And so let's go find where they get used just to show you that as well. Here we go. I'm setting new variable names based on the widget values. So I define the widgets, can put in values, and then I actually pull those into variables by using dbutils widgets.get. Uh, and then once you have that, you can make this uh, notebook dynamic. Uh, I do have this in one of my repos on, on GitHub if you want to look through this code. And, and make more sense of it. And like I said, see my previous video, which uh, talks more about this, this type of processing and what I'm doing here. Okay, I've also got a little bit more try-catch logic. This one is actually not throwing an error. It's just dealing with if it's the first time that we hit a table. And then I let errors bubble up so that they will um, basically cause errors at the wrapper notebook and I'll be able to handle them there. You could try to like handle all your errors and return different values. So we return the success value by uh, specifically calling dbutils.notebook.exit. It's not automatically gonna give you that success text that we're looking for. And so I could you know, do a lot with this, right? I could return some, some values about what I just wrote to, wrote to a Spark table or wrote to some database somewhere and do quite a bit. All right, let's look at the uh, Azure Synapse syntax here. Uh, the, the concept is the same. Uh, notice that with both of these, you've got percent run type of statement to kick off a notebook and run it. But when we're doing concurrency here, we actually need to use the utility feature. So coming down to load table in the Synapse notebook that does this, instead of dbutils, I have MS Spark utils. That's really the big difference. Uh, might as well show you this notebook that we get called. We can actually toggle a cell to be a parameter cell. And so I set up my variables, uh, my Python variables with some values and then I toggle on or off whether or not this is a parameter. Once I do that, whenever I'm calling this either from Azure Data Factory, from another Spark notebook, probably a few other ways, like with APIs, you can call it. Uh, it will let me pass in parameters for any of the values defined in my cells that are marked as parameter cells. And that's really the idea there. Um, the rest of the code is, is similar throughout, not super important for what we're talking about right now. Just know that anytime I'm using Databricks utils, uh, like for the exit, I will go and use MS Spark Utils instead. Uh, maybe a few other things about Delta uh, Delta uh, version and things like that. Though at this point, I ended up going to Spark 3.3, which is in preview here on the Synapse side, in order to have the latest version of Delta Lake, or at least a more recent version of Delta Lake that supports the change uh, data feed. So okay, that's how we would deal with um, setting up the uh, call to another notebook. Now let's spend a little more time on the error handling. The error handling works the same in both Databricks or Synapse. So just pretend I'm in whatever notebook you prefer. Um, what we're going to do uh, that is different from my original video and is actually quite important from the exam examples I've tried to run is we will say, take the, um, take the function I want to run Put that in a try statement. And so if you're familiar with any programming language, you've heard try accept, try catch, that kind of thing. It's basically error handling is what it is. And so I say try, it's going to go ahead and run these. And if everything works fine, it just continues on and skips the whole accept statement. It will do this finally q.task done, which is super important when you're doing this concurrent processing. So make sure you've got a try, uh, accept, and a finally for q.task done. If you don't want to handle your error at all, you could pretty much um, just kind of 
print something or do, do anything that's not super impactful right here in this accept statement, but make sure you have a finally with task dot done otherwise or task underscore done. Otherwise this will be running for uh, a really long time really until uh, something times it out. And so you do not want that. I, I've seen that happen and sorry that I did not address this in the initial video. All right, so let's talk about what we're actually doing if there is an exception. What I've done is I set up a, uh, a list, an empty list right up here. Uh, really an empty dictionary it looks like. And so I'm going to say add a new item to my dictionary if there's an error that uses the table name uh, and uh, as the key. And so I've now got something that says my table badges had an error. So in the errors dictionary, I'll say badges. And then I'll go ahead and set the value of that uh, item equal to whatever error message I want to do or just put the whole error there. You can do it a few ways. I also use logging. I've got a special logging library I'm using, but I'm basically just logging that error message too, because that's typically how I end up seeing it and, and understanding it the best. Okay, and then the uh, um, at the end then, what's going to happen is it's not going to stop running for any errors as I'm processing maybe a, a large list of tables. It's going to keep on going. Once q.join has completed, q.join is what says, hey, go ahead and run all those things in the queue and wait for them to complete before you move on. Since I have my task done and the finally everything will complete, and then I'm gonna go through and say, uh, take my list of errors that I built up and do something with, with each of them. In this case, I'm going to log all of them. And then uh, if there's only, let's see, <laughs> I'm going to log all of them as completed successfully if there are no errors. And then I've already logged the errors as they happen. Let me just be clear about that. And then if there's more than zero errors, if there's any errors at all, I'm going to go ahead and raise an exception. And in that exception, I'll basically concatenate all of the different errors so that it it shows in the exception. I can try to understand what went wrong. If I have 20, 20 errors that all get concatenated, it's not really going to be readable. It's not great for that situation, but that's where your logging will, will come into play and help you figure it out. Okay, so that same process, the same, really the same code. I have a slightly different logging library, so that might change slightly in Synapse for me. That same, same concept is going to work in either your Synapse notebooks or your Databricks notebook. So that's error handling. Uh, hopefully that was clear enough as to how you do it. And you certainly will want to figure out um, your own processes for when something fails in your, your data process that's running concurrently, right? You may need to call out to uh, Slack or Teams and post a message that says something went wrong. You may have some kind of, what, pager duty or something that, that alerts people when something's broken. Uh, all kinds of things you can do. Uh, but that's, that's the basics of how you wrap all that up and start to put your own custom logic inside of it. So another question I got was, um, is this actually using the executors? Um, I don't know if it was a, a question or an accusation that I lied about it. I'm not sure, but it's okay. <laughs> Let's take a look and see if I can prove that it's using the executors with the way I'm doing it. Um, that doesn't mean that you could, couldn't accidentally only use the driver for this. But uh, what I want you to see is that when I expand my monitoring, I'm in the Synapse notebooks in this case, I can see that there's quite a, quite a few tasks running. So I have Spark work happening. If I'm not doing anything Spark related here, then I do not expect it to use the executors. It's going to use the drivers. That, that's always the case if I'm not doing anything that's Spark API related, right? But since I'm doing a Spark.read and a Spark.write, uh, it's going to put that workload onto the executors. One way to tell here is that if I go look at the executors tab of my standard Spark UI, uh, it should be pretty similar regardless of how you're running Spark. There's zero active tasks, zero completed tasks on the driver. And I do have active tasks right now on the executor. And so it has sent some things to the executor. I can even see some of the metrics here. If I look on uh, this may have run a few times, like I can't recall how long this session has been going, but I've got this, you know, several gigs of input, some shuffles, some writes, things like that all happening on the executor, whereas the driver is not sitting there idle. The driver is doing things. It's just not doing spark things. And so <laughs> it's not uh, racking up the numbers here. Um, granted, Synapse is a little funny in that they show the driver as zero cores, which is not true. It's taken up uh, the same amount of cores, four cores for the driver. Um, but yes, it is running on the executor. And if I actually go and look at, hopefully I can get us there. If I go look at the uh, different stages, I've still got one active. Um, and I click in on it. At some point, I'm pretty sure I'll see 
which node this thing's happening on, and it's not going to be the driver node. So it's running on, on this host here, executor ID of two, and that's another way I can see that, oh, there's active stuff happening that is not uh, specifically on the driver. Okay, so it does run on the executors. Uh, the notebook run is a Spark notebook, and so it's definitely going to use Spark for that. Um, in the other example I had though, I was doing spark.read, spark.writes, and it's also using the executors. You can check it the same way on your, on your end if you like to. All right, so that covers that. Let's move on to the last question I'll address today. Okay, so the question came in on how do you do this with Scala? And I might've posted this link already, but let me just give a quick chat about uh, what this is. You can follow along uh, if you're brand new to Scala especially. So there's this post by Databricks that uh, has uh, an example notebook. So this is the way to get started. I haven't really modified it much on my end. I haven't done a lot with, with this particular um, type of scenario with Scala. So um, basically, if you go to uh, databricks.com, notebooks, notebook workflows, uh, you'll find this. Uh, if you search for uh, how to run notebooks, it's really at the bottom of that. So um, just just so you know where we're coming from. Run a Databricks notebook from another notebook is, is the link. And I scroll through all of this, which explains more about what I just did, some different ways of doing it and, and handling errors. And then we get to this piece that's actually answering how do we do this concurrently. So you download the notebook archive. I've just done that here. And now we want to go import it into our own Databricks environment to explore it more. So you'll go to your workspace, wherever you really want to be on the workspace and choose import. And with any luck, we can um, pull in that whole thing. Um, let's look at concurrency notebooks first. So I'm gonna start a ways down where they show the kind of manual way to do it, just so we can talk about what's going on. Um, so with Scala, you've got this idea when you want to do asynchronous, so non-blocking code, we could run one thing and let it do its, do its process in one thread while we start up another thing, right? That's kind of what we're doing uh, throughout this, these examples. Uh, we can use a, you need an execution context, and this is a way to um, get that, it looks like. And then we can say, take a, um, set up a future and a future in Scala is essentially, this is something that may not exist right away, but will exist at some point once it runs what's inside of it. And so you're going to um, set up this future, say what you want to happen to that once it's completed, once we've got the processing that's happening asynchronously, asynchronously done, what happens next? And so we're going to give it a context and we're going to, um, We're going to kick off the, the testing notebook here. And since it's inside of a future, we can then do more things with that while we wait for it to actually give us back that, that result. So the result's going to be what's passed back by the notebook we run. Uh, we can also define another future then at the same time, while this is still processing, it'll go ahead and kick off another notebook. In this case, we've got it called testing two. It does a little bit different things, different parameters, and um, gets that set up. So down here, we're going to take this, um, going to define a future sequence and take both of those futures that are there and, and get those all set up into res. And then we're going to rate, await that. So we said, hey, we didn't want to block until now. Now we want to sit and wait for the results. This is equivalent to that Python q.join. It says, go ahead and run all these things. And until it's done, I just want to sit and wait. Once it is done, we will go ahead and print the value here. Okay, so that's kind of what's what's even important is to use futures and to do something with those futures after all of them have completed uh, and, and, and not have to sit and wait for one thing to happen before the next thing happens, right? The same concept we were doing with Python code. So what, what they end up doing here uh, to kind of show the full picture is they run this parallel notebooks in order to um, get some things available to work with uh, that's showing us that it defined a um, a parallel notebooks that can take a sequence of futures and work with it that way. So um, when we look into this, we're going to build up basically a set of configurations, right, for each notebook. So we're going to run a testing notebook with this setup. 
testing two with this setup, testing two again with a different set of parameters here, which is what that map is. Um, so these are all getting kind of set into a list here. A sequence is the correct term within Scala, but it's basically a list, right? Same concept. We're going to set this result value to whatever parallel notebooks runs. All right. So if we go back to our folder uh, that we just messed with uh, in parallel notebooks, we can see how this happens. And so this is kind of the core to all of it. A little, little bit more complex than the manual way that we looked at a moment ago. So it's going to get futures and await. So future says this thing's going to happen. Go ahead and keep processing as it happens and then do this once it's done. Await is what tells us to stop and wait for it to complete before we do anything else. So well, we set up that that configuration was a class called notebook data, but we already kind of saw how that gets used. And then we have a function called parallel notebooks that takes a list of notebook data and it's going to return back a future uh, list of results. And so that means it doesn't have to wait till it actually knows what each string will be. It can return the future, uh, which we will um, wait for once everything has been triggered, everything's been run in parallel. Uh, that's when we'll really stop and wait for the final results. Okay, with futures, there's this need for an execution context. Uh, I won't get into that too much. I'm not sure I'm the best person to explain that right now. Anyway, um, you can see they do some things with the uh, Databricks notebook context. And then here's where you actually go through and say all of the things you want to happen in order to kind of finalize what that future is. Here's what we need to do to finalize what that future is and get it back to us. Okay, back to back to this doc. If you're new to this, I recommend you take a look at um, the, the feature called Futures within Scala. Um, this is the official docs. I think if you read this, it's a, it's a good starting point. Getting hands on and playing with it's really good. Uh, I don't have off the top of my head a link to something that explains it much better than the documentation itself. I wouldn't get too caught up if you're just doing this kind of in this specific use case and that's all you're going to use Scala Futures for. I wouldn't get too caught up in the execution context. Look at the example, um, kind of figure out what you need to do to make sure yours is working consistently. Um, but that's not something that usually involves nearly as much time as just understanding that you have this future. You can start to map out what you want to happen to that future. Um, and then until it's completed, nothing's actually done. And so somewhere you're going to need to block and wait for that result, uh, which is where that await command comes in. So there we go. That's our view of Scala futures, uh, a quick, uh, hopefully somewhat clear definition of those for you. Uh, and I'd say definitely get hands on and play with that. But um, don't forget that with these notebooks, uh, we have the benefit of being able to use Python or Scala. And so if the futures thing starts to cause any problems for you, you can probably get away with calling uh, from Python, even if you need to um, do some of the work in Scala. All right. So that wraps up that question. And um, really, that takes us to a wrap of all of the questions that I wanted to address in this video. So there you go, some answers to questions with a little demo around uh, different ways to deal with PySpark concurrency within notebooks, both through Databricks and Azure Synapse. Uh, hopefully that was really helpful. Feel free to leave more questions. Um, the more complex the question, the less likely I'll, I'll really be able to answer it in the YouTube comments. But uh, we'll see if I can keep, keep the conversation going if the questions keep rolling in. I don't really recommend this for tens of thousands of different files, different schemas. Uh, that's not really what I was trying to suggest when I first posted this. What I'm trying to say is if you've got 10, 20, maybe I think, I think I've done up to 50 or 80 different tables that need processed or files that need processed each with different schemas. This shows you still kick it off from a notebook and get multiple um, sets of work happening on the, the Spark executors, which is how you normally are trying to scale out your Spark jobs. There is a load on the driver. There are um, you know, threads that stay active on the driver. And so there's going to be limits to how much you can do at once. And uh, it may impact other things running on the same cluster, which um, off, often we do kind of isolate our, our big jobs to be run only one on a single cluster at a single time. But if you're not doing that, just keep an eye out for, for how much workload you're putting on the, the driver. And with Databricks, you can make the driver a bit bigger. That's one thing I've done in the past when we have maybe hundreds of different files that process within a fairly short amount of time. Um, but yeah, just, just play with that a little bit. But I wouldn't recommend trying to do tens of thousands or something like that. I'm really, really pointing more towards, you know, 50 to 100 type uh, data sets that you can share the same code and, and run this way. Another note is that you can use the Databricks REST API to submit jobs if you're in the Databricks space. And that's actually kind of the first way I implemented something like this. 
once I get got into doing this in Synapse notebooks is where I, I thought back to my Python concurrency um, practice from the past and, and put that into play. And, and, and it works pretty well for us. Once you get this error handling in place, sorry that I didn't comment on that more the first time, but, but now you know about error handling, which is a key piece to the puzzle. Hopefully that works well for you. Uh, feel free to keep leaving questions. I'll do my best to address them when I can. See you next time.